Hello, and welcome to the third episode of User Friendly AV. My name is Kate Adkins. I am the User Experience Engineering Manager for Root Integrated Systems, and I am also your host for today's dive into UX and UI for integrated AV systems. Uh, in the last episode, I mentioned this book, Laws of UX uh, by John Yablonski, uh, and I spoke a little bit about Jacob's Law, which is the first law in the book, uh, and how we can take uh, advantage of our user's familiarity with other apps when we're designing our own. So today, I want to take a look at the second law in the book, uh, and that's Fitz Law. So Paul Fitz, who the law is named for, uh, was the first director of the psychology branch of the Aerospace Medical Research Laboratory at what is now known as Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. Uh, he studied pilots and the errors that they uh, were making, reading displays and trying to use controls in the cockpit. And he argued that uh, actually many of the aviation losses of World War II could have been prevented if the cockpits had been designed better. Uh, and so he continued his work um, trying to optimize cockpits, uh, and they continued, moved on to become part of the faculty at Ohio State University. Uh, in 1954, he published his most famous work, Fitz Law. So Fitz Law states that the time to acquire a target is a function of the distance to and size of the target. He proposed that an index of difficulty for a target selection task could be calculated, and the equation for that is log two of twice the distance to the center of the target divided by the width of the target. Now, that's a lot of math, and I'll be honest, I had to look up how to say that because I have not been in a math class in a very long time. High school was a very long time ago for me. Um, so what does that all mean for us in non-math terms, right? So basically, it means that touch targets, like buttons, need to be large enough to accurately select and located at a convenient distance for the most efficient use of the system to occur. So the smaller your buttons get, the harder and more frustrating they will be to use, and layouts that require a user to reach further away and kind of move their hand around a lot will slow them down, again, making the interface feel more difficult than it really needs to be. And feel is a key word here. So you'll hear me use it a lot. Um, and I would actually argue that perception of user uh, interfaces is actually more important than the actual math. Uh, the way it, it feels to a user is really the metric by which we're kind of judging if something is user friendly or not. Um, but the math does give us a good place to start. So let's look at a few numbers, right? A study by MIT um, determined that the average adult human fingertip is 16 to 20 millimeters in diameter. And uh, various entities have kind of made recommendations for minimum target size kind of based on that. Uh, the one that I prefer is Nielsen Norman Group's recommendation that a target be no smaller than 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters, or one centimeter by one centimeter. And I'll tell you why I like that particular recommendation uh, in a minute. But first, I want to share with you a little study um, that I conducted on some guinea pigs, or I mean co-workers, uh, at a Halloween party last year. So I made this little um, simple game uh, in which buttons of varying sizes uh, appear on the screen one at a time. And the player is tasked with hitting the button as quickly as they can so that they can get the highest score. Misses will deduct points. So um, it's both speed and accuracy that are really important here. And since it was Halloween, I made the buttons look like little spiders that squish when you hit them because I thought that was fun. Uh, so there's 35 spiders to squish in each round. Uh, and there's seven different sizes. Uh, so five buttons of each size or, you know, five spiders of each size. And there's six different patterns in which the spiders will appear on screen. Um, so a user could play more than one round kind of back to back and they won't like learn the pattern of where the next spider is going to pop up. I had also kind of intended to uh, compare the distances between the buttons, but I honestly, I ran out of time when I was putting it together um, and I didn't really get to do everything that I wanted to do. It wasn't quite as polished as I'd like. Um, it was still, it was still fun. It just kind of wasn't as scientific as I had hoped, um, but it was a fun experiment. Um, and I did record the size category of each button uh, and the number of misses per button, as well as the length of time in tenths of seconds that uh, tenths of a second, sorry, that each button was visible on screen. Um, so I put all of that data together, I, I printed it out to a log and I put that all into Excel um, and I charted out the results. Honestly, it was pretty much what I expected to see. 
So the smallest buttons, as you can see, which were about um, a half an inch in diameter, was 55 pixels on that particular um, panel that I, I had made. Uh, but that resulted in over half of all misses. And it took an average of one and a half seconds longer to successfully press that button size than any other button size. So you can see a really small button, it's, it's hard to hit it accurately, and um, it definitely takes longer for you to hit it because you know you're missing it or you can't quite get it activated so like i said it wasn't like the most scientific of studies so uh take the, my results with a grain of sand uh but it was still uh just really fun to, to kind of watch my coworkers get competitive over the silly little game and i also think there was still some value in it to take away um and by the way if anybody wants to uh, play around with it or like improve upon it you know feel free to reach out and i will gladly send you my files uh, they were written for a three series crestron processor so if you've got one of those around i just made an x panel to go with it uh, it's super easy and it's pretty fun but anyways as unscientific as that was um, it also kind of demonstrates uh, one of the side effects of increasing the difficulty of acquiring that smaller target um, by making it smaller and that's the misses so I tracked the misses by counting the number of times the wrong button was pressed. Uh, in my game, that happened to just be a transparent button that was kind of layered behind the button that you were supposed to be pressing. Uh, but the same thing can actually happen uh, anytime that you have buttons that are too small and they're packed too closely together. And remember when I said that the recommended target size is uh, no smaller than 10 millimeters by 10 millimeters? but I also said the average human adult fingertip is between 16 millimeters and 20 millimeters in diameter. They don't quite match up, do they? <laughs> There's inevitably gonna be touches uh, outside of that target area unless your target is quite large. Um, so spacing is really as important as size here. You don't want a user to accidentally trigger a button that they don't wanna trigger. It's not just frustrating, but it can potentially be like really disruptive to an event. Um, and especially if the stakes are high enough, uh, even the perception that a critical mistake could be made can cause the user to experience frustration and even anxiety uh, when using that system. Like just imagine, you know, you were tasked with running the system for like an all hands meeting with a thousand people on a remote call and a CEO who has to have everything absolutely perfect. And if you mess anything up, like you could get fired you know, you're probably gonna make darn sure that you're hitting the correct button and you don't wanna accidentally like kill the CEO's mic or, you know, maybe route something super inappropriate to all those thousands of people watching it or something because you accidentally like fat fingered a button, right? We don't want fat fingers here. We wanna make sure that everything can be hit accurately uh, because otherwise you're gonna get like, you know, really hesitant to touch anything and that's definitely not the kind of feeling that we wanna get in our control systems, right? So again, it's all about perception, right? It's per per perception is really key. Uh, it's even more so than the math. So I'm not gonna give you like a recommendation for how many pixels apart your buttons or it should be or whatever, because frankly, pixel count is not that great of a metric for this sort of thing. Um, it, it can kind of get you in the ballpark, but like don't, don't put all your stock in it. Um, especially if you're like me and you deal with like way too many models of touch panels that all have different sizes, they have different resolutions, different pixel densities. Um, you have, you know, a 10 inch panel has like the same resolution technically as like a seven inch panel, but obviously the pixels are gonna be different. Um, it, there's too much to keep track of. I also have like six different monitors with different sizes and different, you know, software development tools that I'm using. It's a lot to keep track of. So going by pixels is not <laughs> the best way to do it. Um, and that's why I actually said that I preferred the Nielsen Norman Group's recommendation for target size, that one centimeter by one centimeter, because it's actually a measurement of like the physical size in the real world. It's not just a virtual measurement. Um, and I strongly advise anyone that's designing a user interface that you actually view it in that actual like physical size that it's gonna be when your users see it. Um, or at least try to get as close as you can to it. And you wanna do this throughout the design process. You'll save yourself so much heartbreak that way, like I promise you, I've, I've been there. <laughs> if you have access to the actual interface that you're gonna test on, obviously that's ideal. Um, and like you can test as you go, that would be the, the way to go. But a lot of times that's uh, not really possible, it's not practical, especially over the last couple of years, I mean, Good luck getting your hands on a touch panel sometimes. Um, you know, 
maybe the gear just hasn't shown up yet, as happens quite often, uh, or you're working remotely maybe, um, maybe you're designing a UI for somebody else's mobile phone and you can't get your hands on like a comparable size model or something like that. Whatever the case might be, um, if all you have to preview your designs is your computer screen, still try to view it as close to real size as possible. Now I'm sure there's probably some sort of like special software tool out there that will let you like scale everything magically to life size and, and do it all for you. But honestly, I'm too lazy to go searching for it and set it up. Uh, and I have my own low tech kind of hokey method for doing this, but I promise you it works. Are you ready for it? So what I do is I look up the specs for whatever panel I'm working with, and then I grab a piece of paper and I grab this ruler out of my kid's art box and I measure out the paper and then I cut me out a paper template. Yes, I told you it was hokey, right? So I take this piece of paper, once I get it cut out, I hold it to my monitor with whatever software that I'm designing my interface in and then I just zoom that interface in and out until I can get my preview uh, image to like match my my paper template on the screen. That's it. Again, it's hokey, but it works. Uh, and no, it's not 100% exact, but that doesn't really matter. Um, it's close enough to let me see like how my design really feels, right? And we're going back to that feel where like it lets me see how it feels to hit that button. Does it feel crowded? Um, does it feel like they're too small um, or anything like that? And, you know, really, if anything is so close to the borderline that being like, you know, a millimeter off on my scaling is going to make the difference between usable and not usable, then I really, I've done something wrong and I should probably make it bigger. Uh, this also applies to text, by the way. So you should be able to like comfortably read any of your text on your panel when you're viewing it at that size. And if you can't, then you need to make your text bigger. Uh, I've seen plenty of UIs that looked really great in the design software and they're practically unusable once you get them loaded, especially to like a five inch or a seven inch panel. And I will admit, I have made several uh, such myself in the past. <laughs> so learn from my mistakes and test your designs in real size uh, throughout the process as much as you can. And of course, testing your designs this way is not just for figuring out um, if your button size and your spacing are appropriate and all of that stuff. Because remember, Fitt's law also involves, uh, it involves size, but it also involves the distance to the target. So pretend you're using your UI on your screen does it feel like you have to move your hand around all over the place to accomplish a task? Um, or does it feel like everything is, is, an, is an easy flow, um, it kind of works well? Ideally, you want to kind of keep that focus in the same general, general area, or you want to lead your user's focus across the interface. You don't want to make them like jump uh, all over the place in most cases. That's why I like web forms. Um, if you've ever noticed you're filling out something on your phone, usually the submit button will be like right next to the last element in the form because you've been led through that form and then now you're gonna hit submit. That's your next action. Right click menus work the same way. So you right click and the little menu pops up right where your cursor's at. Um, that keeps your action, your next action close to where your last one was. So you don't have to waste time like searching the screen and then moving to uh, get to your next target. It's just like right there for you. Now, sometimes you do want to force the user to slow down this way. Like if you want to um, give them a warning and you want to make them stop and pause and actually read what's on the panel, because sometimes people don't, I will tell you that. Uh, quite often people just don't read what's on there and they'll just hit buttons. So sometimes you do want to force them to move to a different spot on the panel, but you're going to have to draw their attention there. Um, and, you know, it, it is going to slow them down. So just be aware of that. I've generally found that keeping uh, the most used items in the center or the bottom half of the screen tends to be more efficient for users. Um, and items that don't need often, you can usually go like in the upper corners, uh, that's usually a good place for them. But it really does depend on uh, what kind of interface you're dealing with and how it's gonna be mounted. So like uh, if it's gonna be a mobile interface, uh, it's gonna probably be up close to somebody and their hands are gonna be close to it. Um, and you can look at, there's all sorts of guidelines out there for uh, mobile app design. They're really great for that. 
But for touch panels, like it's a little bit different because um, they're, they're usually going to be at arm's length from the user. So you want to make sure you're keeping that in mind uh, when you're designing things. Is it going to be mounted on the table? Are they going to be sitting at the table and then reaching across? Or is it going to be at a, on a wall at eye level and they're going to be reaching out? Um, so you're going to want to try and play around with that and see what feels better. Uh, and, you know, if, if the menu needs to move or whatever, you'll, you'll kind of get that feeling if you can actually see your image, uh, your design in, in real size and kind of play with it. So I think that's enough uh, for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe learned a little something useful. Uh, let me know what you think by dropping a comment here. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at userfriendlyav. That's all one word. I'm also on LinkedIn if you prefer that route. Um, so definitely let me know what you think. Uh, if you've got any, uh, tips for testing without hardware, maybe you do know of some super special software tool that we could all benefit from, please share. I'm sure we could all use it. Uh, and if you have watched any of my other episodes, you know that I like to share resources. So I hope you do too. Uh, and speaking of which I would like to share another resource with you. So today's resource recommendation is Laws of UX by John Yablonski. I mentioned this book at the beginning of the episode, um, but what I'm actually going to recommend to you is the website that goes with it. Uh, that's lawsofux.com. The book is great. Uh, it goes into a little bit more detail of each thing, but the website is this wonderful uh, little quick guide, uh, and there's a bunch of links in there to additional resources. I plan to work my way through most of these uh, on this channel, so you can kind of follow along through here. Uh, this aesthetic usability effect is definitely one that I'm going to be pulling up soon. So keep your eyes out for that one. Uh, and, uh, you know, consider it your homework if you've never heard of any of these before. Go through it and uh, see what, what you can find. My next episode will actually not be a dive into the laws of UX though. Uh, instead, I am planning to share some of the trends that I find at Infocom this year. Yes, I am heading to Orlando very soon for my first ever Infocom, and I am super excited about it, and I can't wait to share it all with you. Um, if you are also going to be at the show and you happen to see me wandering around, please stop and say hi. I would love to chat with you. You will definitely be able to find me on Thursday morning. I'm going to be part of a panel discussing broadcasting and education environments. That is Thursday, June 15th from 8.30 to 9.30 in the morning. Um, so you can definitely find me there. And if you do find me at the show, I will have some of these lovely stickers uh, if you want one of them. So ask me for one of those and I will be happy to hand you one. And if you like what I'm doing here on YouTube, uh, please do all the stuff that every YouTuber always tells you to do at the end of every episode. And you know what it is. Um, and please come back again. I've got some fun stuff planned. Um, might have a couple friends stopping by. So I hope you will come back for all of that because it's going to be a lot of fun, I think. Um, and until then, thank you so much for watching. Thank you so much for all of the comments and the feedback so far. It's been really great. And I hope uh, this is something that's really, you know, going to going to stir some conversation among the industry. Uh, and it seems like that's what's happening already. So I'm super excited about that. Um, I really appreciate it. You guys are all awesome. And I hope you have a good one. I'll see you later. Mm -hmm.